Hello and welcome to Insight. I am Elizabeth Omori. Today will be my search light on the national language policy which was recently approved by the Federal Executive Council for Primary School Pupils, which makes mother tongue a compulsory medium of instruction from primary one to six. With more than 500 local languages, how would this policy be fully implemented to promote the use of all the languages? Stay tuned, my guest will clear your doubts. Tuberculosis is a contagious infection that usually affects the lungs. Medical experts say it can also spread to other parts of the body, like the brain and spine. In 2021, a total of 1.6 million people died, actually, from TB. And worldwide, tuberculosis is the 13th leading cause of death and the second leading infectious killer after COVID-19. An expert will enlighten us on this health concern as we look at prevention, management and response. These are the German issues before us today on Insight. Once again, welcome to the program. I'm fascinated with the discourse on national monuments and assets and how much is being done to preserve and Look into the language issue. We have turned English to become like a pride value in our own cultural values. It's not cash transfer. It's not a COVID-19. Invasion 1897 was a deliberate Deliberate you know, many of these people attempt. coming to the urban areas now. These and applications, um, there are terms and conditions. That of course, mean, um, it is sense. the union of uh, two people, a man and a woman coming together. My name is Namdi Odipo. And I'm Elizabeth Omori. and stakeholders to proactively tackle these challenges. We Women in most countries of the world constitute about 50% of registered voters. Kevin Williams reporting for Dateline 360. In Jaws, Caleb Gochin, Deadline 360. Deadline 360. Shidi Okrafo. For Deadline 360. In Lagos, Michael Olaleye. Reporting for Deadline 360. I am Omosola Omojola. Thanks for tuning in. language policy which is a deliberate effort to mandate specific language behaviors in particular context is characterized by many obvious implementation defects recently the federal government approved a new national language policy which makes mother tongue a compulsory medium of instruction for public primary school pupils across the nation how will this function my guest professor Ismail Jinaidu, Executive Secretary, Nigerian Educational Research and Development Council, will speak to us. Yes, thank you so much for joining us on the program. Thank you very much for having me. All right, could you enlighten us on the national language policy? What does this policy entail? Yeah, um, thank you very much. Um, as we all know, human capital development is very important and very crucial to any nation building and uh, language play language plays a very very important role also in the human capital development efforts um it is for this reason that seeing nigeria you know having so many languages okay it is for this reason that um the Honorable Minister of Education in his uh, ministerial strategic plan in 2015 to 2018 and later revised 2018 to 2022 put high, very high premium as one of its um, you know, uh, components, the issue of language policy because um, we cannot have any meaningful development without having a deliberate effort to plan for use of our very many languages in Nigeria. 
as we may come to find out later, we had a language survey in the country where we went to every nook and cranny of the country, all local governments, and you know, and we found that we have 540 languages. That's quite huge. Very huge. And uh, in that regard, you have to know how to use if care is not taken because language, again, is very, very much linked to culture. Oh. If care is not taken, if we don't plan very well in all our endeavors, we would see that uh, some of them would be out of place totally, you know, out of the whole world. And for that reason, there has to be a deliberate attempt, deliberate, you know, effort to plan for the use of these languages. As we come to see also, it's not only um, in education, but in all spheres of the nation. I quite understand your explanation, but you know, in some climes, uh, the local languages are actually used to encode and decode programs. We also take very good, you know, very careful um, effort to develop what we call the guidelines for the implementation of the language policy itself. These guidelines are meant to guide whoever, you know, uh, I'm going to use the languages both at uh, our three tiers, you know, local government, state and federal, to be able to get it implemented very, very effectively. So there are guidelines developed to go along with the language policy itself. Okay. Well, I, I, I still need clarification on the choice of language. Now, I need you to break the technicalities of this policy because um, if we have a community, let's say a poor community, oh. and we have children with, um, th that speak Yoruba, yes. for example, yeah. they dominate that particular uh, our community. Does that mean Yoruba will be the language that will be used to teach these children? Yeah, Yoruba in this case would be used from primary one to six would be used to teach the child mathematics, to teach the, to teach the child uh, science and technology, okay. to teach the child civic education, to teach the child English. Yeah, so it will be all, you know, all languages, irrespective, I mean, all um, subjects. I know maybe you, what people would come, what come into my, what is coming to my mind, to your mind is how can we teach mathematics in Yoruba? Mm -hmm. That is the illusion. That is the kind of thing that we we see. Everything you know, ev language is capable of teaching whatever, and our languages are capable of teaching uh, um, mathematics, teaching physics, teaching biology, and what have you. Mm. Yes, so, so there is no big magic about that. Once you follow, we get the guideline right when it comes to the implementation. Okay, I quite understand you. But there's an aspect I want you to hit on. Now, for a child that will start school from, let's say, age six, primary one, yeah. or age five, and then to primary six, around five to six, that should be like ten, no, five years. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. And then when that child leaves the primary school to the junior secondary school, let's say from Genesis 1 to 3, is that child still going to be taught in the local language, Genesis 1 to 3? No, no, no. Now it will, now it will now be switched it's to It's different at the uh, junior uh, school. Now it will be switched to English okay. because the child right from class 1, primary 1, would be taught English. Uh -huh. Then as it, you know, you keep on teaching the child English up to primary 6, by the time the child goes to ju junior secondary school one, now the language of instruction would now be English. Okay. But now it's extended to be, you know, uh, um, one to six, primary one to six. Okay. Yeah. All right. I believe um, implementing the curriculum is, another, is a challenge, would be a challenge. What would the agency be doing in this regard? That is right. That is why we say now the, the guidelines was, you know, has spelled out this. And we will now make effort to start first even developing the orthographies. Okay. That is the writing system for all the languages. I am glad to say so far we have developed orthographies for about 60 languages in Nigeria. And we keep on doing that, you know, 
this is all in preparation to implement in the policy itself. Uh, 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 deliberately, again, there is issue of uh, teacher training. You know, the teachers too have to be trained in, in this respect. That is mm -hmm. why at the uh, NCE level, that is in colleges of education, education. there is the, you know, the, the minimum standard they drive is from the curriculum that uh, we develop for the, you know, uh, uh, teaching of the various subjects. So it, it is something that would have to be, you know, you get the teachers to be prepared, you get the materials. Luckily for us, some, many of these Nigerian languages have um, um, reading materials, mm. you know, particularly when you take Hausa, Ibo, Yoruba, Efek, Ibibio, you know, and Benin. the rest. There are very, yeah, there are a lot of, um, uh, uh, you know, reading materials and instructional materials. What we need to do is to intensify effort in producing more of these relevant teaching materials to realize the, the policy, the implementation of the policy. Prof, I, I strongly believe it is a very, a huge project. Yeah. It is not a project um, to take lightly, but I believe this will help prevent language extinction. Seriously. That's right. That's so right. are there other benefits inherent, you know, in this policy for the Nigerian child? Yeah, the, 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 the benefit you find, language is tied to culture. By the time you lose your culture, you, you lose everything. Now, so it means that the benefit the child would get is to bring to the fore now the issue of uh, getting our children to know their language, which in a way to know their culture, which in mm. a way to help in developing them as human beings, you know, to be proud wherever they go to, whatever they do, that we have our, you know, culture to be proud of. So there are a lot of benefits in this um, policy. Interesting. Yeah. Well, I, I, I strongly agree and I'm, I think uh, keen into this uh, policy would really help because some parents don't even have the time, don't speak their local languages or dialect to their children. But we have to really think about other stakeholders in the education sector. For example, the local authors. How would this promote local authorship? You see, that is why now the publishers too must be sensitized to follow the dictates of the curriculum, to follow the kind of materials they produce, to be in compliance with our cultural norms, you know, so that now they, they key in. And there is a, we also regulate the production of the instructional materials themselves. We have developed guidelines for even the assessment, you know, uh, um, for the production of whatever instructional materials to the publishers. So it's a kind of um, uh, um, exercise that would involve a lot of sensitization and uh, advocacy. And we are ready to just start that. This is just the beginning to have the policy and we are happy that the Federal Executive Council has already approved this policy. And uh, what it uh, uh, means is now getting seriously on the implementation so that we see it you know implemented to the latter in all aspects of our endeavors in the country it's not only in education oh. it covers the the media it covers even now with the the, the aviation you know this simple thing that you take uh, is, is very important you join any airline now most of the airlines is it france airline is it uh, uh german it, you see they announce in the, you know, in, in the language before, you know, they use English. The same thing here can be used. I'm glad some of the airlines have started uh, where you, they announce, uh, make announcement in the local languages. languages. Yeah, which is very, it's, 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 you know, it's doable. Mm -hmm. the, the only thing is to, to, to sensitize and appreciate that there is merit, there is uh, added value. There is, you know, very important uh, things to be derived by doing such kind of things. And we have started, once we intensify our efforts, uh, I'm sure we would get things done. We'll get them done. Yes. Okay, aside promotion of local authorship, there's also another issue, translation. Mm. How are we going to address this? You, you see, there are so many things to be uh, um, tackled. It's not only development also graphy there are what we call meta languages also 
There is the issue of the development of the dictionaries, you know, because dictionaries would help a lot when you come to do the, 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 the translation of um, some um, documents or whatever you do. But the most important thing is not only to be translating, but to be creative in the language itself, uh -huh. not to translate from one or from English to say Yoruba or from English to Igbo or Hausa, Efik or Tiv or whatever. No, to even be creative because there is already, already a belief that a child would be more creative when you start teaching that child in the early stages of the education in the mother tongue. Uh -huh. So, so that kind of thing, you know, we are not only uh, going for, for translation, but at the initial stage, of course, there is need for you to do that. But we want this thing to be original, original in the languages themselves, mm -hmm. not necessarily translation. Of course, translation would help a lot at the initial stage, you know, of whatever language uh, you are going to use in the educational system. All right. Uh, yeah. Prof, while analyzing uh, the national language policy, we found out that um, it is only applicable to public schools. Why are private schools exempted? This is another area that I think um, um, we have to be very serious on. When you develop a policy, it's not only for the public school, it's for every Nigerian child. Okay. Now, this is where we have problem. It is the responsibility of each state government to see that whatever policy is, um, is, 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 is existing is complied with both public and private. Private schools are not exempted in uh, you know, uh, implementing government policies. That is why you find that uh, even though education, for example, is on concurrent list, you find that there is a forum whereby both the federal and the states meet, you know, what we call the National Council on Education. Yes. Whatever policy is produced, it is tabled and agreed, the decisions are agreed by all the states in Nigeria. Because such kind of forum you find there are commissioners of education coming with the Honorable Minister of Education chairing. And policies are tabled before such kind of... So it is the responsibility of the states to see that the policy is not only restricted to public schools. No, the policy is meant for every child, whether in public or private. Whether in public or private. That's right. So this is very clear now. Yes. Now they will be taught in the local dialect. Mm. Have you had, is there going to be a stakeholders engagement? Are you going to be engaging the parents and then teachers? And then do you see a drop in the number of pupils in public schools for now? because of this policy part of the strategy for the implementation is uh, advocacy and sensitization and this would involve all critical stakeholders in this case now it would be for you know policy makers the parents themselves you know you have to do a lot of uh, you know getting child to speak english is not education okay. since the colonial you know era yeah I, I could remember, for example, I know I was taught in my primary one to three in, in, in Hausa. Not English just came after, you know, in class, uh, in my senior secondary school. That is that time, primary five to seven. Mm. Because it's seven years you, 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 you spend in the primary education. And it, it was all we were taught uh, English in Hausa taught uh, then agricultural science in Hausa, taught geography in Hausa, all till the time we reached class four. Then, you know, you started with the, 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 the English up to the time you finish uh, the, 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 the university. So it is really very possible. You see, sometimes we become, we fear change. And now the only thing now that we have done is to bring it more to the fore that now it is very, very important for us to have a very coordinated and comprehensive policy. And we have to see to the implementation of the policy to the latter. It is possible. It has been experimented. Very, very possible. We always bring the issue of the IFE. There was famous IFE project where, you know, Juaren uh, uh, later Fafumwa, former Minister of Education. And it was done. Primary six were taught 
you know, in, 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 in Yoruba, science and mathematics, all subjects. It's really possible. What we need is to have, you know, commitment to the implementation. And as I said, yeah. there will be a lot of uh, meetings, there will be a lot of uh, 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 stakeholder sensitization and advocacy in this regard. By the time you follow the guidelines, I'm sure we'll be able to achieve. And it will be to our benefit, to everybody's benefit in Nigeria. Okay. Yeah. Are we going to be having synergies, international synergies, uh, cooperation on this to make it more effective for us? Yes. Now, in, in this case, we are really very encouraged. Just last week, we had a visit of the uh, um, Secretary General of the Organization of Educational uh, um, Cooperation. This is an, an international organization by member states comprising, uh, you know, states from Latin America, uh, from Africa, uh, from Asia and the rest. And uh, we were really encouraged when the Secretary General actually visited. And he was telling us Nigeria is the first now among the member states to bring about this mother tongue education. And this has given us encouragement because in the end, for the agreement that we have signed, the member states, we would have no choice but to encourage and imbibe the provisions of mother tongue education for inclusiveness for the whole south south you know of the globe so we are encouraged by that kind of state and we became very very happy to find out that nigeria is the first among the member states to start talking about this mother tongue education with this um, national policy uh, and then on this national language policy now we are in the right course Interesting. Yes. That's a very huge and encouraging step you have taken. Yeah. But Prof, before I let you go, yeah. I need you to speak to schools and parents on embracing this policy. Yeah. You see, um, we would like to encourage uh, and uh, advise parents and teachers to really take this very, very serious. Now, this is even in the wake of what we see now in some of our publications that are going against our culture. As I said, language is tied to culture very, very closely. You see some kind of books now which parents have to be very, very careful. That is why, again, mm. government has made it to assess mm -hmm. any book that is going through our educational system. Of course. And uh, my council is charged with that responsibility. We realize that most of these books that are not our, you know, are not culture compliant. At all. Have not even come to our assessment. There is no way we would allow such kind of things, you know, now going on. We have seen in the media, you know, books that are very, very, you know, anti culture, our own culture, mm. and embracing the language policy, the provisions of the language policy that is giving importance to our language which is tied to the culture, such kind of things will not happen. We are, we are, you know, we are losing, gradually losing our, 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 our values. And we can't allow, we can't allow these kind of things to, to, to happen to, 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 to happen or to continue. Mm -hmm. happen. Parents should shine their eyes on the books they really see. From government part, mm. government is doing all it can to stop such kind of publications that are going on now and is, is because of the uh, violation or going against the cultural norms and this language policy which is encouraging use of our languages which are tied down i keep on saying to our culture will stop these kind of things they stop this yeah. kind of things yes. all right prof i wish i had enough time to talk to you but i want to thank you so much for coming on insight to enlighten us thank you very much for having me i wish we would have time to talk more on the quantum sometime we would uh, we would have time to come and discuss about the guidelines yes you know for the implementation of this very laudable and uh, internationally recognized policy nigeria is um, in a very right course for taking these steps and the honorable minister of education is very very serious and committed to realizing this all right thank you so much prof yeah, we do you. appreciate your presence thank, thank you very you much very much thank you 
I'm fascinated with the discourse on national monuments and assets and how much is being done to preserve and Look into the language issue. Thing. We have turned English to become like a pride value in our own cultural values. It's not cash transfer. It's not a COVID-19. Invasion 1897 was a deliberate Deliberate you know, many of these people attempt. coming to the urban areas now. These and applications, um, there are terms and conditions. That of course, mean, um, it is sense. the union of uh, two people, a man and a woman coming together. My name is Nambi Odipo. And I'm Elizabeth Omori. and stakeholders to proactively tackle these challenges. We know. Women in most countries of the world constitute about 50% of registered voters. Kevin Williams reporting for Deadline 360. In Jaws, Caleb Gochin, Deadline 360. Deadline 360. Shidi Okrafo. For Deadline 360. In Lagos, Michael Olaleye. Reporting for Deadline 360. I am Omosola Omojola. Thanks for tuning in. Every year, around 245,000 Nigerians die from tuberculosis. TB accounts for more than 10% of all deaths in Nigeria. Every hour across the globe, nearly 30 people die from the disease. Doctors say the risk of developing active TB could increase because of HIV, and nearly one in every four sufferers is also HIV positive. With global attention on this killer infection, how do we reduce the burden and save more lives? My guest, Dr. Omayeli Sesere, head of leprosy and Muruli Ulcer Unit, will deal with our focus. Doctor, thank you so much for joining us on Insights. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so happy to be here. Thank you so much. You know, uh, there's this notion that when you see someone coughing consistently, you just have to be suspicious. Tell us, what actually are the causes of tuberculosis? All right, so tuberculosis is a disease that is caused by a bacteria, a microorganism, organisms that we look at under the microscope, um, a bacteria specifically, Mycobacteria tuberculosis. And it, is, it affects different parts of the body, but most commonly the lungs. So when we talk about tuberculosis, the most common cause is what we call pulmonary tuberculosis, which just simply means tuberculosis of the lungs. And the signs that you see are cough for more than two weeks. And so as you said earlier on, that is why when a person coughs for a long period of time, you're being suspicious. So cough for over two weeks, night sweats. So a person sweating um, at night, uncontrollably at night. We have fever and we have weight loss. So when there is unexplainable weight loss over a certain period of time, we say these are the four cardinal signs and symptoms or symptoms of you, as you have it of um, tuberculosis. And when a person has any of these symptoms, we encourage them to, to come check, to get checked for tuberculosis. So those are the four symptoms of tuberculosis that we look out for. And we always encourage anyone with those symptoms to please come and get checked for tuberculosis. Yeah, as a medical uh, practitioner, why is the diagnosis and treatment of tuberculosis very difficult? We always try to stress that what we're trying to do with tuberculosis is create awareness and not fear. Because we have a lot of people who are suffering from this disease but refuse to come to get checked for it because of the stigma and discrimination attached to it. So people say once a person has tuberculosis, it's a lifelong illness and the person is, you know, condemned for life. I don't want to ever, you know, mar even marry a person that's ever had tuberculosis. And those are wrong misconceptions, misconceptions about tuberculosis. So stigma and discrimination, because people don't know. You know, once you understand a thing, then you are able to handle it. People run away from what they don't understand. 
So tuberculosis is a treatable and curable disease. Okay. What that means is with effective treatment, the disease will be cured the, the disease will be cured and you will not have it again except there's reinfection which is another ball game but that's not what we're focused on you know today so tuberculosis is treatable and curable and tuberculosis diagnosis and treatment in nigeria is free which a lot of people don't know so we're, we always try to get a message out across to people that tuberculosis diagnosis and treatment in nigeria is free of charge all you need to do is to walk up to a hospital the staff they have been trained, once you present with these symptoms, they have been trained to direct you to the right unit, and then you go through some investigations, and then the treatment is given free. So okay. stigma and discrimination is the main reason why people run away from tuberculosis and why we are not finding these cases in the community. So stigma and discrimination, yes. two issues we need to deal with. Right. Now, Choki, still on diagnosis why is it that when people are diagnosed with hiv tuberculosis seems uh, to be a major infection what is the relationship could it be the lungs all right so thank you so much for that question um, there are certain risk factors for tuberculosis right um, one of them is poverty another is diseases that affect the immunity okay. so tuberculosis is right is everywhere in nigeria so I can assure you that you've probably inhaled the tuberculosis bacilli because you go to the market, you ride on public transport every day, and if a person has tuberculosis and the person coughs out. So let me stress that tuberculosis is transmitted when a person who has active TB disease coughs or talks or sings or shouts okay. and releases this bacteria Whoa, into the atmosphere. Yes. So um, when they do that, they release the, the bacteria into the atmosphere. And when people inhale those bacteria, they go to the lungs and then can develop into active TB disease. Now, for a lot of people, it doesn't develop into active TB disease. But if your immunity is low or you have some other um, diseases that can cause you to be more um, prone to the development of the active disease, then you would come down with the active TB disease. Now, HIV is a disease that affects the immunity. It reduces the body's ability to be able to fight diseases. So when a person has HIV, diseases like tuberculosis, we call them opportunistic infections, come up, you know, and the person, is, person comes down with tuberculosis and some other diseases. So that's why you have the correlation. So HIV, other diseases that reduce the immunity, um, even drugs. There are some drugs when a person has had transplants and you take drugs to reduce the immunity, immunity so it doesn't fight against the new organ that has been put into the person's body can predispose you to tuberculosis. So that's the relation, be, relationship between HIV and tuberculosis. And, tuberculosis. Yes. and there's barely anything you can do to prevent yourself from inhaling that bacteria, except you literally go around living your life with a nose mask every day, every minute of your life, which is not possible. So we say it's important that you eat right. So malnutrition is also a risk factor for developing tuberculosis. So we say if you eat right, you exercise, you do what you're supposed to do, um, you are building your body's immunity against tuberculosis. So yeah. it's not um, a disease that um, you can say if a person is careless, if a person, so that we don't have people being labeled as careless when they come back with tuberculosis. Okay. Yes. So. So, what is the level of response to this infection? We have been doing everything we can to ensure that we control tuberculosis in Nigeria. And with the help of um, partners from all over the world, we are able to, you know, gain momentum in the fight against tuberculosis. The government, we are grateful for um, a Minister of Health who is dedicated to this cause. A lot of money goes into tuberculosis. Um, ordinarily, the treatment, the diagnosis and treatment of tuberculosis is quite expensive. And that's why we've said that it's free now because we have support to be able to make it free for the common man. One of the risk factors for tuberculosis is poverty. So a poor person w might not be able to afford the diagnosis, the tests, and then the treatment, which is quite expensive. 
And one thing, we're doing everything that we can to ensure that, you know, we combat this disease. It is very real. When you were reading um, earlier on, you said about 245,000 people, people yes. Nigerians, die from tuberculosis. That is a lot. For yeah. a disease that is treatable and curable, mm. we definitely need to do more. And we need more support from the private sector to enable us to continue in this fight of, for, of, against tuberculosis, rather. At what point does the government come in to meet the response? All right. Um, recognizing the fact that um, tuberculosis diagnosis and treatment can be expensive, um, we provide free services from the point of diagnosis down to the point of treatment. In, in quite a number of hospitals um, around the country, we have trained staff who, once a, pe a person shows symptoms of tuberculosis, will collect the person's sample, pass that sample through, um, through tests, and then when the test result comes out, the drugs are given to that person. So literally all the person needs to do is to come to the hospital. Once you come to the hospital, every cost from then on till treatment is taken care of. That's interesting. Yes. Yes. So now tell us, on this particular infectious uh, disease, what is the level of advocacy? All right. So that's th thank you so much for that question. You know, if you ask the common man today, quite a lot of people say, wow, does tuberculosis still exist? Or there's no tuberculosis. It's probably um, village people or something <laughs> along those lines. Um, I would say the awareness of um, the presence of tuberculosis amongst us is quite low, even amongst our decision makers and policy makers. And that's why we are trying to go all out to ensure that people know about this disease and they know what they can do to ensure that we fight this disease in Nigeria. Tuberculosis is very real in Nigeria. And we need, so we have um, TB champions, um, wives of f first ladies of governors in different states who have taken up the challenge to um, ensure that the, the awareness for tuberculosis, you know, is, is out there and they do everything they can to fund or, su or support the treatment or the control of tuberculosis. So we need more organizations like that. We need more people like that who recognize that this disease can actually, so it's not just a disease of the poor. It can actually affect anybody, anybody. who has the risk factors for that disease. And that's why we need all hands to be on deck to ensure that tuberculosis is controlled in Nigeria. Okay, before we talk about ending this epidemic b before 2030, some say, oh, this particular uh, infection can be treated traditionally. Mm. How true is that? All right. So, um, you don't say because um, palm oil is red and petrol is red. If it can't need petrol, you give it palm oil. There is, there are, there is bacteria that is causing this disease. And there needs to be antibiotics to fight this particular disease. So one thing we've tried to do in our program is we recognize that a lot of our people trust the traditional healers even more than the medical system. Okay. So we've tried to engage them because in some communities in our, in our villages, they would not go to the hospital except they first gone to the pharmacy. So we've engaged these pharmacies, the pharmacies and the pharmacists there. We've engaged the traditional better attendants. We've engaged traditional healers to um, enlighten them that whenever you get a person with these symptoms, the treatment is antibiotics refer them to where they can receive these antibiotics. And we've made the process easier. So we've linked this um, traditional better attendance to different hospitals where we have services attending to those with tuberculosis. So um, the treatment of tuberculosis is antibiotic treatment for a certain duration of time, depending on the kind of tuberculosis. Now, I wouldn't take us into a lot of uh, medical jargon, but we have different kinds of tuberculosis, and the duration of treatment varies on or depends on the type of tuberculosis. So antibiotic treatment is the way to go when it comes to tuberculosis. And this is very important because a major control measure we have 
is early detection and treatment. A number of people have this disease, but move around in the community. We don't get to them on time, and then they spread the disease. Now, it is said that every person who has active TB disease and is not diagnosed can infect up to 10 to 15 people in a year. So imagine you having 40 people moving around in the community with active tuberculosis. You can imagine the ripple effect. My national coordinator always say, we are sitting on a keg of gunpowder. Hmm. So imagine if people, now, for instance, it's estimated that about um, 452,000 cases of tuberculosis in the country. But um, as of last year, we're able to get above 250,000. Hmm. So that shows you that there are a lot of people still roaming about with active tuberculosis spreading the disease. We need proper advocacy, engagement by the community, engagement by our private st stakeholders to ensure that we're able to track every single one of them and then treat them. So early detection and treatment is a major control measure that we can use to curb the menace of, of tuberculosis in our society. And that's one of our focal points in the tuberculosis program. Uh, let's talk about uh, a particular demography of the population, children. Yes. Is this visible in children? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Um, as a matter of fact, um, we have a lot of children. So it's mm. said that if you have um, a certain number of cases of tuberculosis in the country, about 10% of them, 10 to 12% of them will be children. Mm. These children are getting this disease from adults who are coughing. So grandmothers, aunties, uncles who have not gone for treatment and are coughing and these children live with them. And the disease is spreading. So when a disease starts affecting children, you know that there's active transmission of that disease. And that's what's happening with tuberculosis. Quite a lot of children are dying, painfully so, from tuberculosis because they are not getting access to treatment for it. So we have a lot of children um, who come down with this disease, young children, older children, adolescents, and we need to ensure that we get those cases and treat them. We even need to ensure that we prevent the children from getting those diseases. So we always emphasize, um, if you notice that you're coughing, it doesn't take anything from you. The test is free. If you notice that you're coughing for, your cough has lasted for two weeks or more, or you have any of the symptoms I mentioned earlier on, please walk up to the hospital and tell them, I'm coughing. They will direct you to where you will get the test for free. And when the test comes out free, then, you know, as they say, nothing spoiled. You can go about your day if it's negative. But yeah. if it's positive, then you can now take the drugs to prevent so many other people from getting infected. Talking about meeting targets, do you see Nigeria meeting the SDG target on ending TB epidemic by 2030? It is possible. Okay. But we need a lot of um, investments into this disease. Um, because there is a thinking that uh, maybe tuberculosis doesn't exist anymore or is affecting the people of the, is affecting the poor, poor people, um, there might not be need to, you know, engage or to fund this, um, the control of this disease. But we need a lot of engagement, private sector engagement, private sector investment into this disease. We as a national program are ready. We have officers in the 36 plus one um, state in Nigeria who are ready. We have offices, we have units, we have well-trained officers who are ready to carry out every activity and intervention in the control of tuberculosis. But, and, and we're grateful for the funding from the government, we're grateful for the strong political will of the government to fight this disease, but we also know that there are so many other diseases. And so we need people, we need private the private sector to come in at this point to ensure that they invest in the disease, so that in the control of the disease, so that we can achieve all those goals by 2030. All right, as we raise advocacy on this uh, concern, what would be your words to carriers or those with the disease? All right, so um, if you've been diagnosed with tuberculosis, um, the first thing is it is not a death sentence. It is treatable, it is curable. So if you take the drugs that have been prescribed to you by your physician, then you are assured, if you take them the right way, then you are assured that at the end of the treatment duration, 
you would even you will feel better even before you finish the drugs you will start feeling better but we encourage that you must finish the drugs so it is not a death sentence if you have been um, diagnosed with the disease ensure that you take your drugs and ensure that you become a TB advocate in wherever that you are to let people know that this disease exists but it can be treatable if only you present um, for for diagnosis now to people who have any of these symptoms and you know that you have these symptoms but you're afraid to go and get checks maybe because of what people will say um, I want you to um, summon courage knowing full well that for yourself you need to get better for yourself and then for the Nigerian populace as at large you need to ensure that you get tested and then you get treated tuberculosis is not a death sentence it is treatable and it is curable so please get tested so you can't say um but my father and my mother had it therefore i will have it no 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 there are risk factors which we stated earlier on that can predispose a person to it but it's not hereditary it's an infection uh, okay what if i use a utensil used by someone with the bacteria okay good so that's one question we get um commonly so we always stress that tuberculosis is not passed by using um, the utensils used by a person that has tuberculosis and if a person has been diagnosed with tuberculosis and the person takes their drugs um, faithfully the way they ought to by the end of two weeks the person is not infectious again so we say the person cannot spread the disease to other people so if a person in your household has been diagnosed with tuberculosis and is faithfully taking the drugs the way they ought to you are free to interact with the person the way you should now a person that has tuberculosis, we always stress respiratory etiquette. And that is, if you have to cough, cough into a tissue and dispose of the tissue immediately. Um, don't cough directly into the open air. Cough into a tissue. If your tissue is not available, you can cough, in, cough into your elbow and, um, and or use a tissue and then dispose of the tissue. So if a person has that cough, we always encourage the person to um, to observe respiratory etiquette to ensure that you don't pass that to other people. But tuberculosis cannot be caused by um, kissing. Tuberculosis cannot be caused by um, sharing intensives with other people. Um, so tuberculosis cannot be caused um, by sexual transmission, right? So it, we have had cases, very rare cases where it happens, but it's not a disease we say can be caused by sexual transmission. So if your wife or your husband has been diagnosed with tuberculosis, that's not a time to, you know, shut them out and, you know, run away from them. With the effective treatment, then they are fine and they will, be, they will not pass the disease down to other people to in other the household. So we should actually treat people with uh, infection with love and concern. With love and care and, and, care. and honor, yes. All right, Dr. Mayeli Cesare, I want to thank you so much for coming on the program to enlighten us. It's really an expose. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. I'm fascinated with the discourse on national monuments and assets and how much is being done to preserve and Look into the language issue. Thing. We have turned English to become like a pride value in our own cultural values. It's not cash transfer. It's not a COVID-19. Invasion 1897 was a deliberate, deliberate tactic. You know, many of these people attempt. coming to the urban areas now. These and applications, um, there are terms and conditions. That of course, mean, um, it is sense. the union of uh, two people. A man and a woman coming together. My name is Namdi Odipo. And I'm Elizabeth Omori. And that's inside today. Thank you so much for watching. Remember, building a progressive nation is a collective responsibility. Let that positive change begin with you. I'm Elizabeth. Or Maury. I'll see you next week.